All right. We have another Scientolopedia podcast. Today, we're going to pick up part two of remote viewing. Remote viewing is a um, fascinating subject. And we have a special guest coming on too in a minute. I'll introduce Mr. Robin Adair in a moment. But I thought I'd just bring you up to speed. By the way, my name is Dave LaCroix. I'm your host. And we're going to do a in-depth or as in-depth as possible look at the subject of remote viewing, uh, the players who were instrumental in kicking it off in the CIA-sponsored program at Stanford Research Institute. But I just wanted to mention that this is the second of the series. The first series, we went into a little more of the background of remote viewing, uh, sort of what set the stage for it. There's a long history of people being interested in psychic phenomena, para, paranormal phenomena, and of course, um, heads of state and powerful people wanted to see if they could tap into that down through history from the, um, you know, you got the Oracle at Delphi to uh, Edgar Casey to, you know, people like Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, consulting astrologers to Nancy Reagan. I, I hear even Hillary Clinton uh, consulted astrologers, but it's a common thing that's gone on forever. Uh, trying to get uh, an inside track on extracurricular knowledge. In fact, let me just see if I have it here. I can read. Um, there was one from, um, what's this? The uh, Psychic Battlefield was a publication, but they say as far back as ancient Egypt when King Nectanabus use magic and wax figurines to control the coming battle. Military leaders and heads of state have used virtually every magic trick in the book, in the occult book, to influence the course of international relations. Bizarre as it may seem to those impatient with such things, the practice continues to the present day, which is what we're going to touch on, with even the Pentagon and the CIA trying to a hand at metaphysical warfare. So that's uh, another perspective, kind of reinforces what I was just saying. But we touched on the um, the fact that there was a convergence that occurred after in the 20th century after we're coming out of World War II. The um, OS then the, it was the OSS, which became the CIA, and the Soviets had an interest in exploring whether or not there were possible uh, mental technologies that could be developed, mental, uh, uh, you know, powers that could be exploited to create a Manchurian candidate type of thing or to uh, be able to uh, militarize, basically, mental capabilities of people. And at the same time, in the 1950, of course, L. Ron Hubbard came on the scene and he had a different track. He was not trying to figure out how to use the mind as a weapon. He was trying to figure out how the learning more about how the mind work could be beneficial to mankind, how people could get rid of uh, unwanted emotions, uh, aches, pains, uh, physical suffering, stupidity about how the mind works and that sort of approach. So these two tracks from the CIA and the MK Ultra program we went into, uh, which was using drugs and hypnosis and surgery and, and radiation and, and dead bodies left and right all over the place um, versus L. Ron Hubbard coming out with a little handbook manual that would undo their work. <laughs> so he, he was on their radar at an early point there in the 1950s. Now, they sort of diverged and came back and bumped into each other. Uh, the church was raided and these things were going on. They were all secret at that point in time. We're looking back from 45 years, 50 years on and seeing how this all kind of happened. But at the time, it was all secret. It was a different world back then. 
and move forward a little bit to the early 1970s when they came back again and they collided again with a CIA sponsored program for remote viewing that was initiated by Scientologists, which is something that we're going to go into a little bit why that's not broadly known out it's known among scientologists but it's not acknowledged or talked about or known in the uh, academia or the press or the radio shows the uh, that talk about these things they poo poo it or they downplay it or they lie up flat out lie about it even the scientologists who were involved were going to show how they lied about it anyway let me uh without further ado get going on this show and bring in Mr. Robin Adair, who is a um, Scientologist, he's an OT7, original OT7, and he is also a trained auditor who uh, audits people on a regular basis today. He did his training at ASHO and then at the Advanced Organiza Organization of Los Angeles he audited, and he's made us a hobby or a study of all this CIA involvement that went on and all this, um, all these shenanigans that occurred were going on surrounding remote viewing and other things that they were involved in. But um, he has a lot of knowledge on these things. So Robin, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Well, thanks, Dave. Yeah, Good. it should be interesting. Good to talk with you again. So you heard my uh, preliminary. I'm going to bring up, I guess I should show them. I uh, had a slide. Where'd it go? Oh, no. Um, what did I do with your slide? I had a uh, slide of you. Oh, well, there it is. I put it in the wrong place. Anyway, you know your uh, image that um, was sort of, colorized or texturized or <laughs> whatever I, that's the one i've got up there for you so you're a man of mystery and uh you're you're calling in rather than you're not we have no video on you because you're a man of mystery i guess <laughs> that's right <clears throat> i hate being on and video it, anyway that's quite all right i'm going to back up people are seeing some of these slides but uh I was going to mention them when I was doing my little intro in the background. I guess that's why I had it out of place. I, uh, in the previous show, we talked about the definition of a remote viewing from what the Stargate definition was or what the CIA, uh, how they defined it, um, and then versus the um, Scientological perspective of it, which is, you know, there's a, such a thing as a Thetan and a, which is also a static that has no location in space or in time and you know we went into exteriorization and so we, there's a different uh perspective of what remote viewing is what's actually occurring there and in a little bit i've got a little segment where hal pudoff doesn't seem to know where it came from or how it works <laughs> he plays stupid uh which yeah. anyway that's we we you and i have talked about that how these guys they, they don't want to admit their involvement years later do you have any theory why they would yeah you know why they would uh disavow Uh, Scientology. I, you know, it, it's kind of hard to. It's like a theory, so that, you know, and it's not documented, so we don't really know why these. They, they, you, we can speculate on why they do this. You know, it's, I mean, there's no, there's no actual documents or smoking gun saying, well, we're gonna try and eliminate any reference to Scientology and remote viewing. It just seems that it seemed to be a natural progression as time went on 
for some reason that you know they they didn't mention it I, you know I, I don't know uh exactly why but there's uh you know maybe they didn't want anyone to know the actual source of this information and where they got it from you know yeah it could could be that so that's an elitist point yeah it's the typically elitist point of view right they yeah you know under the uh phrase that knowledge is power and that they have this inside track on something and they don't want anyone else to know where it's coming from yeah you know, this is, i mean we're dealing with the intelligence community as such and this is sort of the way they operate it it would be considered a method or source you know and going way back to when the cia was first uh you know brought into being by legislation one of the they had one key directive that was you know to protect sources and methods at, at any cost and you know maybe they consider Scientology to be a source and method and they don't want too many people to know where they got this information from anyways that's my it's just you know speculation Purely. Yeah. Well, we'll touch. We'll touch on Pat Price yeah. too because he died under suspicious circumstances, and maybe that put a little fear into them. Uh, who knows? You know, that's pure speculation. Uh, why? But we have this thing of the two key players in the whole remote viewing thing, both sort of disavowed or pretended that they had nothing to do with it after blatantly, you know, uh, being, you know achieving OT7 and uh, in the case of Ingo Swan, a class six training. <laughs> but um, let's just go right into, um, we've got Mr. Hal Pudoff, who um, mm, yes. just um, real quickly, he, uh, I did, you know, just looked up what his resume is, uh, master's at the University of Florida. Then he was in Naval Intelligence, worked for the NSA, National Security Agency. Then he had a PhD at Stanford. And, you know, after I saw that, I, it occurred to me, Stanford, who do we know that was a key link between Scientology and Stanford? Mr. Phil Spickler. Now, I don't know if that's how, oh, okay. when, when and how he got in, but it sure makes sense because there's a lot of, like, there was John Brody, the football player up there, and uh, of course, his mm. daughter later ended up making, uh, marrying Tom Cruise and got him into Scientology. So mm. Phil Sprickler could be a key player here. He was dealing with a lot of celebrities, but I don't know that for a fact. It's just coincidental that um, Hal Pudoff, you know, did achieve this the level of OT7 in Scientology. And there he was at Stanford Research Institute. And then while at Stanford is when he started getting involved in this remote viewing stuff. Um, he was a physicist, got his doctorate, um, PhD in uh, physics and studying lasers and their, um, their effects on things. And I'm going to play a little uh, segment of him in a minute, but um, you know, anything else about Hal Pudoff that, would be bearing on this on his resume and did you ever meet him around the orgs back then me personally no i i'm just uh you know from what i've read about him you know he's he was the one who uh started the project at sri with uh russell targ who isn't a scientologist but is very much into studying uh an anomalous phenomena, as they call it, or parapsychology. And he's yeah, I published a, quite a number of books. Yeah, I have, I have a uh, picture up right now. Him and uh, Russell and uh, Hal uh, in front of the S an SRI building. Yeah, these two wrote the book on remote viewing called Mind Reach, which came out in the uh, Late 
And uh, you, cut, you cut out there for a second. It came out when? In the late seventies. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah, they were. So I mean, there's a lot of interesting information there, where they discuss the uh, the Iranian Hall of Science experiment. And what is that? I've heard that, but uh, Varane Hall of Science. Uh, that was the uh, with the that was the uh, magnometer. Oh, okay. You know. Yeah, we'll go into a little bit more yeah. on that when we touch on uh, Swan um, and some of the experiments. Um, let me uh, bring up. People can get an idea or a flavor of um, Pudoff. First of all, his statement that. Um, about the whole project, um, I have a, just a short little uh, audio and video, so we'll play that right now and then talk about it. You'll see that I've labeled this CIA initiated remote viewing program at SRI International. Although CIA initiated it and the first programs were with the CIA, it wasn't very long before as our results began, uh, began to be known around the community, that we then en ended up with separate contracts with the Navy, with the Air Force, with the Army, with some places I still can't name. And finally, the Defense Intelligence Agency came in as kind of an oversight, uh, over umbrella kind of function. And so most of the work that we did uh, in this period was uh, really you would have to say a DIA program, Defense Intelligence Agency. Now, he's got a uh, slide showing here, uh, Robin, uh, talking about there's Scanate, Sunstreak, Center Lane, Gr Grill Flame, and Stargate. I mean, these guys love their um, right. their class their classifications code names. and then code names. <laughs> anyway, there's a little bit, just yeah. a little bit more to this audio. I'll play the rest of it. To give you a bit of a timeline, <clears throat> historically the project was top secret, special access program. And you'll see these names, Scanate, Sunstreak, Centerlane, Grill Flame, and so on. Well, he just said basically what I had said. So he's acknowledging, uh, right. one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up was because um, he's acknowledging the... Um, uh, role that the CIA had in this. A lot of people, uh, that's no big surprise that they sponsored the research. But it's, I think, real, real important to nail down that it was a government sponsored program. And here is a Scientology OT7 and a Scientology, two Scientology OT7s that were uh, right there at the beginning with the CIA. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Exactly. So, not, nothing earth shaking there. Now in a second, I want to talk about his going into, um, he was studying lasers and physics and so forth. And then he talks about how did the, how did this program get going and how did it sort of get started? Um, you know, how did the CIA uh, get interested in him and why at Stanford Research Institute? Well, first of all, going back to our previous show, Stanford was one of many institutions around the country. The CIA, CIA loved to use universities and institutions for either covertly uh, through cutouts or other intermediaries or overtly that they were, it was known that it was a CIA program, but in this case, I guess it was, it was a secret program, but it was known that it was sponsored by the CIA. And Stanford was a major player for the government doing research. In fact, he gave a, where did I have that? I made a note of how much actually was, um, Funded 300 million annual revenue, and this is around this time. That's what Stanford Research Institute was making. A third of that was um, 
you know, whatever, just various research, but two thirds was the government programs they were doing research for by the government. And half of that was for CIA and other intel agencies. So we're talking about hundreds of millions that's being spent annually you know, by the CIA just at Stanford. So how much more are they spending around the country and around the world on uh, various things? Now that doesn't, that's not just psychic or mental research, but Stan Stanford was a, a major player at that time. So. Very true. Anything else that you've ever come up with regarding Stanford Research Institute and what they were, uh, their role in things? Well, Stanford Research Institute uh, was uh, one of the progenitors of uh, futurology, you know, research into what would happen in the future. Uh, Alvin Tolvin's book, uh, Future Shock, came from that uh, area. You know, Margaret Mead, you know, we have a bunch of elitists talking about shaping how the future would be, basically. Okay. And uh, that was, you know, incubated at Stanford plus the Internet. Uh, they did a lot of research on uh, the, uh, at that time it was called ARPA, you know, Advanced Research Projects agency which became DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, where they were researching, uh, you know, linking up all computers worldwide. And they became one of the nodes in, you know, the internet. <clears throat> so they were doing a lot of research on, you know, what would eventually become the reality in the future. Right. Cool. And, uh, yeah, it's a hot. It was a very. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, as you were going to say, it was a hotbed of research, basically. You yeah. know, in computer technology and you know, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. A lot of, uh, like you say, you know, if the, the beginnings of the internet and um, futurism. I mean, that's Menlo Park area. That's Northern California near San Francisco for anybody that doesn't know where that is. Um, you know, you had Bell Labs and all kinds of research uh, facilities uh, and, you know, the whole Internet, uh, you know, Silicon Valley just uh, was born out of that area. So um, the next uh, video I want to bring up is um, Hal Pudoff again talking about a couple of things and I'm going to, I'll stop it and we'll talk about it, but here we go. Uh, I became we, interested in the issue that many physicists at the time were interested in and that is, well, we can handle inanimate uh, objects, we can handle particle collisions, we can look at astrophysical phenomena, but what about things like life, like consciousness? Is it just that it's too complex? but eventually we'll be able to figure it all out from quantum physics or, or do we have to extend physics? And so that was something I was struggling with. Okay. I'm going to call him on the first. I'm, I'm calling BS. There's several uh, points here, <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, but here he is as an OT seven. He's been around Scientology. He's read the axioms. He's uh, been audited. He's uh, for sure gone exterior, most likely anybody at that level would have mm. some reality on exteriorization and he's pretending to want to research into life, you know, find out about <laughs> life, and source of life. I mean, this is a, a, a form of lying, you know, when you pretend stupidity or unknowing or that your motives or what you're looking for is different than, you know, oh, mom, I was just passing through the kitchen. I didn't really notice the cookies on the shelf there and I didn't really take any, you know. Uh, anyway, just complete BS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so unless you have totally. any comment, I can continue. I can. He, that's just the first of three whoppers he tells here in this little segment. So.
Oh, Next carry one. on, carry on. <laughs> okay. As were many of my colleagues, and about that time was when uh, a well-known polygra uh, polygraph expert by the name of Cleve Baxter was doing experiments. And one day, just on a lark, he happened to connect his polygraph up to a plant. Okay. Whopper number two. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just on a lark, on a lark, he happened to connect his polygraph up to a plant. Well, in the previous episode, oh, yeah. we showed the pictures of L. L. Ron Hubbard. A decade earlier, was published in magazines as having done these experiments with an emitter, which is a far better instrument, more sensitive than the polygraph. And Cleve Baxter would have since he was working for the CIA, would have certainly known about that. He was a polygraph, Scientology e-meter. They had raided the government, had raided the churches and taken the e-meters from them. It was in the press and the news. He was a polygraph guy. He for sure knew what the e-meter was. He knew what L. Ron Hubbard was. And he would have undoubtedly known about LRH's plant experiments. But anyway, here's Hal Pudov lying through his teeth about it. Yeah, right. It just happened. Yeah, right. Uh. Anyway, yeah. uh, I get a little I get a little bit righteously indignant at these people that try to, you know, hide the source of some knowledge or especially when it comes to L. Ron Hubbard, because they want to make him look like, you know, they, they like to show these pictures of him looking at a tomato plant with little you know, alligator clips connected up to it and, and make it as if he's crazy. And here's a guy, which as we'll go on, I'll show his publications and a best-selling book. Well, he's not crazy because he works for the CIA, I guess. Anyway, I get a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> Let me continue. We'll go for the next okay. whopper. He tells another whopper here. Okay. Up. This sounds like fun. You see on people. And then he thought of uh, burning a leaf on the plant to see what response he would get. When he had the thought, the plant responded. And so that started a whole series of experiments where he seemed to have gathered uh, data indicating that uh, living organisms that are brought up together are somehow in, in contact with each other. And yeah, he just sort of seemed to find these things out and seemed to do this and seemed to do that. Well. Anyway, I'll continue. I'll, I'll shut up. And so I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, these days we would talk about in terms of quantum entanglement. I thought, okay, well, maybe we can learn something about organic life, consciousness, or whatever by examining interactions between plants, between algae cultures, or whatever. Here he's lying again about, you know, thinking that maybe he could learn something about life and understanding quantum entanglements. He did have had accident one already. Anyway. <laughs> so what I did, from a purely physics standpoint, I wrote up a proposal to be funded where I was going to take some algae culture that had grown together, separate them by five miles, uh, zap one with a laser beam, and see if there was a response on the other one. See if I could measure the velocity of propagation between the two and so on. So I sent that off to Cleve Baxter to see what he thought of my idea. And one of these serendipitous things, I got to tell you, it scares me when I think how my life has changed because of real flukes. But here's Okay, here he comes. He's going to pretend like he just by serendipity runs into Ingo Swan or connects up with Ingo Swan through this plant experiment connection with the CIA guy. He calls it serendipity. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, all right. I'll continue. Example. You know, just one so of happened the Cleve Baxter went to a cocktail. Go ahead. What was that, Robin? One, one of the maxims of, you know, law enforcement and the intelligence community is nothing happens by coincidence. You know, there are no coincidences. Right. So... Anyways, carry on. Okay, I'll back it up a little bit. So, I got to tell you, it scares me when I think 
how my life has changed because of real flukes. But here's an example. It just so happened that Cleve Baxter went to a cocktail party in New York City, and while there he met an artist by the name of Ingo Swan. Okay, so that's where we... Uh, <laughs> That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a guy who was. Now, this audio was taken from 2008. So, 30 some years later, mm. he's claiming that it was serendipity and uh, he doesn't understand. You know, he's, he's going to get some, do some testing on what, how life works. And serendipity brings him together with Ingo Swan. Anyway, but there was a little, a little comment in there that was interesting. He says, so I put this together to get some funding. You see how that works? Like they were, these guys weren't doing this just mm. out of the goodness of their hearts, <laughs> which mm. is another point exactly. on L. Ron Hubbard. You know, they, they, he gets a lot of criticism while he started a church in it for the money. These guys, they're spending hundreds, they're getting hundreds of millions a year being spent on this type of research. Uh, they're doing work based on grants and, and money from the CIA. Money is what makes the world go round. How is L. Ron Hubbard supposed to find, you know, publish his research or develop his research um, just out of smoke and mirrors or something or by getting, you know, holding a cup out on a street corner or something? Anyway, it's just annoying. Uh <laughs> So uh, that's Hal Pudoff. Well, that, I think we kind of go ahead. Well, you can see what direction uh, the whole remote viewing uh, project went be because of government funding, right? That's that's why Ron avoided it. Government funding, you know, he talks about how, what happened to the Ford Foundation and the Rhine Institute and all those institutes that got government funding they all ended up doing whatever research they did for military and you know government applications and screw anybody else you know like the public <laughs> you know the people who actually funded it you know with their you know taxpayers so you know so you know no surprise here how i was just you know stepping into the <clears throat> shoes of others who had gone before them and, you know, sub subverting their research for government purposes, you know, simple. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, you know, people have been bought off, I guess, in the past. We could probably safely say that. People have oh, been yeah. corrupted. Uh, oh, yeah. You can see how the remote viewing project got, totally got corrupted if you study the history of it. <clears throat> yeah. You know, after the government funded it. You know, because in the beginning, when the CIA first got a hold of it, they mainly used Scientologists on the project and, you know, and somewhat adhered to using Scientology techniques to a greater or lesser degree and then as it moved on as it advanced in the military applications they started using other things like other forms of psychic you know research and that like reading tea leaves and i mean the list can go on and on i think uh paul smith talks about it in his book reading the enemy's mind it, it just you know how they managed to screw up the whole remote viewing program getting sears and channelers and witches and god they i mean they totally went into the they went into the total dark side of a cult so yeah. anyway interesting you know. well that'll be show show number three we're going to follow up this one and go where it left where it went to from stanford research institute on you know up to the present and uh, ramifications it had with the church um mm. Things like that. So let's um, let's have a look at Mr. Ingo Swan. Who, oh yeah, Ingo. Unfortunately, as as um, much as he did and as famous he is, he turned out to be a liar too. <laughs> it's kind of you know not 
not very nice to say about the he's passed away, you know, but when it comes to this, you know, people that don't acknowledge where they get their um, their kickoff point from uh, in this area, I, I don't have a lot of wiggle room for being reasonable, you know, but he um, early on uh, rightfully and righteously acknowledged the um, in fact, the, uh, you know, impact that L. Ron Hubbard had on his mm -hmm. abilities and the Scientology had on it. But then later he doesn't make any mention of it and uh, disavows it. I know you had um, talked about, he gave a presentation, something called, uh, do you remember what that was called? A Scientological Perspective on, it's a real long title, uh, Remote Viewing. Yeah, you know, it was Scientology, Scientological Techniques, and uh, uh, let me see, oh, here it is. I put you on the spot with trying to get you to remember something, but... Um, uh, oh, it's true. Uh, oh, okay. It was called Scientological Techniques, a Modern Paradigm for the Exploration of Consciousness and Psychic Integration. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that was like around 1973, yeah. as I recall, right? Yeah, he gave that paper to the uh, Psychotronic Conference in Prague, 1973. So, I mean, they were sharing a lot of intel, you know, on psychic research between there. It's it's funny, you know, if you think about the intelligence community, I mean, they all know the uh, thing is that they just keep the public in the dark, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the <clears throat> the Soviets and the, the Americans, uh, you know, they they join hands in keeping the, you know, their their respective publics in the dark on what they were doing, basically, and they were involved in psychic research, you know, and uh, I mean, this is this is, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. I mean, Prague, Czechoslovakia was a considered a Soviet satellite at the time, and they were discussing, you know, things like psychic integration, you know, exploration of consciousness, you know, and, uh, you know, he talks that's about... Right. I was just going to say, that's right, you know, point that out, Prague, Prague was a, a Soviet satellite, so they're definitely swapping information between the two countries, you know, it's no secret they're investigating these things. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, you know, they just ho hoodwink the public on what they're actually doing. But you know, like, I mean, I'm sure the Soviets and the Americans were well aware that they were both, in their own way, working on, you know, using uh, psychic phenomena or what the Soviets called uh, psychotronics in you know, for intelligence and military applications. I mean, we're both involved to a greater or lesser degree in it. So, this so was, Engel, you know. so, yeah, so Engel was, um, this was 73, just be before that, like what Hal was talking about, where how he sort of by chance at a cocktail party <laughs> met this guy, uh, Cleve Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i know that, but that's how later um i've just got i've got a slide up where advance magazine which is a publication by the advanced organization of all the advanced any of the advanced organizations which deliver the ot levels it's a major scientology entity and a, a publication uh and they did. They interviewed him twice. Uh, the first one was in '73. I have a just a quote from that one where Advance says, "How did these abilities develop with relationship to your auditing on the OT levels?" Ingo says they are solely the result of auditing, not particularly even the OT levels. So he repeated that again in 1978. But you go into his later stuff up until his death, and he doesn't make any. Uh, so he presents this Scientological paper in 73, does this advanced magazine thing in 73, and then also in 78. He's working with a Scientologist at SRI 
and yet they're hiding this relationship later on. It's just very bizarre. Nevertheless, oh, yeah, he's he, an artist. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, he. if you read remote viewing the quote real story unquote or the real lie as I like to call it he assiduously avoids any mention of Scientology in his you know internet book he, he doesn't you know he said that he he left those people in the early 70s which is you know a crock of you know bovine excrement because he didn't leave the church until the early 80s after completing uh, Otto did not, so, you know, yeah. he's, uh, <clears throat> what can you say? And, you know, he well, gave that interview in 1978, so what do you say? Yeah. Well, I'm not <clears throat> going to beat him up uh, more, really continually beat him up. I just wanted to drive it home because it's very important later on, as history would have it, we still have people lying about this today. And if you try to go into the relationship or what impact this whole remote viewing uh, experiments had on the CIA's interest in or government interest in and possibly want to take control of this random uncontrollable entity known as the Church of Scientology. Well, if we can establish that people are lying back then then maybe other people are lying about it too and our viewers or listeners you know it's up to them to get real smart and sharp on uh discerning reading between the lines and figuring out where this went how what motivations would lie behind intelligence agencies regarding the creation of spiritual or telepathic or mental abilities that they might be interested in anyway so Ingle Swan was an artist I've seen his art uh, you know it's a lot of it's very spacey and wild but he was a, a known artist at the time back we're going 69 you know sick late 60s mm -hmm. early 70s and he was at City College I guess there was I don't know the name of it but he did some experiments in telekinesis he was moving things around and that's when he bumped into this Cleve Baxter and the plant experiments and he's he tell he communicates with Hal Pudoff that he could help him in his experience or experiments at Stanford Research Institute what he was proposing to do uh, Ingle Swan could be a very uh, helpful test subject so that's when they hook up I think I have a picture of them together um now oh, this is the shielded magnetometer no i thought i had a picture of uh put off and uh swan together at uh, stanford but i don't seem to be able to find it immediately but anyway do you know any uh, more details or anything you want to add about that period when he was at Silly City College in New York and doing those kind of experiments? Well, I mean, we know that Ingo was a good friend of Yvonne Jentz, who was the uh, original executive director of Celebrity Center International and may have had a hand in actually founding the uh, celebrity center and there, there's no question that he would have known Hal Putoff at the time because of you know the, the number of OTs at that time that level of OT was in few hundred I'd say around 700 or so so you know it's no doubt that they would have run across each other uh, at some period during that time because AO was just down the street from Celebrity Center in the LA area. So yeah. they, Is that Lake, Lake I'm sure they, yeah. So they, they would have come across each other at some point in time or, you know, met, met each other at various Scientology gatherings, you know. And, you know, they did the OT levels around the same time. So they probably ran across each other 
uh, while I'm doing the advanced courses. So it's like this is this whole serendipitous BS is just BS, basically. They probably had it all prearranged long before that. And put off himself. I was going to say, knowing you know, I knew Yvonne, and knowing, knowing how she probably sat them down together and said, "Why don't you guys get together and do some experiments?" You know, and so they make it like it's an accidental meeting. But I wouldn't be surprised. She had her hand. Oh that. yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah. he was an artist. He he would put he he had you know some renown in that regard, and he was also uh, had a bit of a reputation as a psychic already he was in the psychic community mm -hmm. before they right. started the, the experiments at stanford so um which brings us up to he had this um i've got a slide of the shielded magnetometer that um Putoff tells a story uh you say it was at the valerian institute is that where it was varian varian, varian. hall of science yeah in uh at Stanford University. Okay. Oh, it's yeah, where they had this shielded magnometer that uh, measured quark, you know, like subatomic particles. Mm -hmm. And he managed to influence that. It caused quite a stir. And when we say shielded, but, no, uh, it was actually buried and had no access to it, physical access. You couldn't look it at it or touch it or anything. Yeah, and it was surrounded by a Faraday cage. So, I mean, it was immune to uh, magnetic interference of any kind or electronic. Right. And I, I saw the documentation. They have the docs of where the uh, machines that were measuring this magnetometer actually registered a change when Swan put his attention on it. And it stopped when he took his attention off. And they repeated that after they came back and calibrated their instruments and rechecked them and so forth. And he demonstrated it again, which is when that got sent up, which is what got some real strong interest from the CIA. That The write-up on that is what got really got the CIA interested in funding this uh, further research. So that was yeah, exactly. Totally I mean, it was that sort of aligned with uh, what the CIA wanted from psychic phenomena, which was uh, psychokinesis, you know, the ability to influence objects at a distance. Like that was their, that was uh, you could call it their holy grail. Yeah. So I mean, they were they had uh, representatives from a office of technical services at the time there and uh, it's written about in kenneth cress's uh you know uh parapsychology and intelligence uh, monograph that he wrote for the uh, center for studies of intelligence in the cia and later was released as a nature article but that was that was one of the experiments that got their attention or that so they say you never know what what the real truth is when you're talking about the cia so <clears throat> yeah well the yeah. according to the timeline that i have they um after this magnetometer test they started doing things like hiding things in boxes or envelopes and testing swan's ability to identify what was in the boxes or envelopes and putting things inside of film cans and that sort of stuff. So they were kind of mm -hmm. messing around with a lot of uh, little small scale testing, but, you know, documenting it. It wasn't just, you know, on a, in the living room on the coffee table or something. They were, you know, in a professional environment, testing his ability and, and measuring percentage of accuracy and that sort of thing. Um, exactly. They would do stuff like, um, you know, put a, turn a laser on and off in another room and he would tell them when it was on and off. And uh, so one of the things that's interesting, and this is a theme that got repeated that I came across were um, the fact that they were getting good results. Now you mentioned that they 
were looking for this ability to, you know, perturb things or to create an effect on physical objects. But according to Putoff, he said that their results were kind of depressing the CIA and they were not happy that they were getting positive results. Um, now, I can only speculate why he would say that or why that might be that they didn't want to know that somebody could do this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, this is in a way it's bad news for the CIA to know that there's random individuals around the world who could possibly, you know, have some sort of an effect on physical matter that they don't know about or don't know how to control. Anyway. Well, exactly. Uh, um, Putoff says as much in the article that he mentions in, in that, uh, you know, the sound, sound bite you had posted there, he, you know, CIA initiated remote viewing. And he says in that article, I don't have it in front of me, but he says that a lot of the attention was spent on doing a threat analysis of the phenomena, you know, like how to prevent a psychic spy from infiltrating, you know, various government facilities. Because one experiment was that it act well, supposedly, accidentally, they found uh, a top secret no such agency uh, facility <clears throat> in uh, you know the the green mountains of Virginia, uh, a place called Sugar Grove, which was uh, mentioned in the book The Puzzle Palace, right? And yeah. uh, it was uh, Vaughn and uh, Price who actually uh, did a pretty good job of describing what was there and actually. Uh, did some diagrams on the facility that that shocked them so much that they initiated an internal investigation to find out how they found this out. Anyways, so I mean, no, I, was, I, uh, to... Go ahead. There was some. There was some. There was some definite heebie-jeebies, you know generated around that time about this phenomena, you know, I mean, if, if it really did what it could, then, you know, like, uh, their secrets weren't going to be safe, <laughs> basically, because right. anyone who, who has had psychic abilities could access them, and, they, and there was no way that they could prevent them from doing it. So they were trying to find some way to prevent that from happening, so a lot of it was based on a threat analysis. Yeah. Right. Well, we're going to get, uh, if, if these early ones of, uh, you know, making a, a quark uh, magnetometer uh, jiggle or being able to tell what's inside of a film can got the, gave them the heebie-jeebies, then some of the later stuff really shook them up. And we're going to get to that. Um, CIA residents, I've got a little slide coming up on uh, what they said about that. And um, somewhere, let me just go through a few things that they did in the timeline, though. They, they wanted to uh, set up some protocols, and uh, they wanted, Swan originated that he wanted to try something a little bigger by sending people out to locations and, you know, being able to describe or draw the, um, the locations, which they, they did, and they became very you know, very good at it. That's one of the most well-known aspects of remote viewing is that, you know, uh, I think you use the term outbounders were used to, but that's mm -hmm. where it started around this point when they, uh, and there's, I got to mention another guy we'll just touch on, but a, not a Scientologist, but this guy, Joe McMonical was um, instrumental or helpful in setting up these protocols for the outbounders. Um, so he was involved at this time. Um, there was another technique they called analytical overlay or uh, a factor that started to come into play where when they get information, uh, the term was called analytical overlay, wh meaning that you'd get an impression, but then you'd analyze it analytically and it would skew the data. 
which is, um, right. you know, from a auditing perspective, you could say when you've got the meter and you keep the PC running down the time track on a particular thing or staying on a, you know, not Q&Aing off of it, but in remote viewing, it's more of a, you know, you get an impression of, you know, you say the guy standing on a bridge, um, you know, in San Francisco, but then you analytically say, well, but there's a, you know, there's a train going by or something. And so you, the analytical overlay would sort of cloud the results a bit. And they, they recognize that, which is, you know, a good, uh, a important part of their techniques that were used in later remote viewing training. Um, but um, the guys, uh, Swan and Price, we're going to talk about Pat Price here in a moment, but they uh, tested them very thoroughly and rigorously, submitted them to all kinds of physical tests. And probably about this time, I'll tell a quick story about Pat Price. When he was tested, one of the tests, he got the results. And I knew him because um, we actually shared a house. <laughs> so I know him pretty well. Um, but anyway, I was present when he received a phone call. I think it was getting the results from one of the tests. It was a written test and Russell Targ had been on the line because he answered, yeah, it's Russ, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just hearing the other side of the conversation, but what he was done, he said he got the results from a test that originally they had said that he had gotten a question wrong concerning the distance between New York and London. And he had told him to go and check it, double check it. And when they double checked it, they found that, in fact, he had the right distance, um, but it was his distance was on a straight line between New York and London, not over, you know, over the horizon. So that was just a little example of Pat Price's abilities to, um, you know, come up with data that was not normally or wouldn't be uh, commonly known. Um, but they did this, all this testing of these guys and they put them through some rigorous stuff and, you know, Pudoff makes a comment that he knew them or they were tested better than the astronauts at the time. <laughs> um, but there was a CIA guy, I don't have the name, but he came in, they wanted to, uh, you know, really double check and make sure they weren't fudging on these, uh, experiments. So they put it to real serious critical analysis and they kept coming up with positive results regardless of how how much they tried to the cia the bosses tried to throw them off and when they came time to um publish a paper they wanted to publish it and they went to bell labs up there in that area which got published was sent off to the russians and so the secret was kind of out but it was still a secret project, but um, I just wanted to sort of give the frame of all this is going on where they've got the CIA intensely interested in what they're doing, they're publishing papers, and there they've got sitting amongst them this guy, um, Pat Price and Ingo Swan, two Scientologists, and they give them a task to uh, remote view a CIA employee's residence back in, I don't know whether it's, what was it, Virginia or North Carolina or whatever. And it turned out it was, they, uh, you cut out, where was it? Virginia. Virginia. Oh, yes. that's close. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, it turned out there was a NSA facility that was top secret that was nearby. And that's what they ended up zeroing in on and describing got a picture of Pat Price up right now. So you talked about that just a minute ago, but um, they both remote viewed it and Swan um, came up with information. And then um, I have a document about uh, what they said, Pat Price, this Kenneth Cress, who I know you know that name. Mm -hmm. uh, wrote about it, he said, Pat Price, who had no military or intelligence background, provided a list of pro project titles associated with current and past activities, including one of extreme sensitivity, 
also the code name of the site was provided. So that's what he's talking about. So. Oh, yeah. That freaked them out, I think. That took it to another level that they could have one of their own facilities looked at and described and even the code name for it come up, be brought up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so, Pat Price not only, not only remote viewed the facility, but he also went into one of the uh, buildings and viewed the files in there that had those code names and special projects and all that kind of fun stuff. So, and he was giving the names of each of the projects to, you know, those who were supervising the uh, remote viewing action. Right. Yeah, we didn't hit on Pat yeah. Price yet. We mentioned him, but uh, we should do a little bit about him. Uh, may have been the real superstar in all this because of uh, some of the things he came up with. But uh, he had been a Burbank police commissioner. Not a lot more known about his biography, except he told me that he was in he was an intelligence uh, worked in intelligence in World War Two. Um, and um, he was selling Christmas trees when somehow serendip serendipity struck again and he <laughs> got in touch with Ingo and or Hal and became, you know, one of their remote viewers. Now, serendipity was that, you know, the laws of average. Here he was in OT3. And, you know, knew Yvonne, knew Heber because he was Mormon and they had uh, met and knew each other. So anyway, they just were, I'm just pointing out the ridiculousness of these guys pretending to just by accident meet, meet up. But uh, he was apparently selling Christmas trees when they made the communication to test, start testing him. And he started coming up with some pretty amazing results. Um, yeah, all this serendipity, huh? Yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> I'm going to bring up one. Um, I'm showing a picture of this Richard Kennett, who was a CIA scientist. Uh, and it's a picture of him with Pat Price and Hal Pudoff. And then... Uh, I've got the quote where they, uh, um, you know, they say that he came up with that information on that NSA facility. Now, one of his most famous and the ones things that are on the internet are this um, drawing he did of a Soviet installation where they had uh, he drew a crane and uh, facility. And uh, do you know much about that? I have a l short little. Um, uh, tape or oh yeah, it's one of the on more it. yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite famous. He uh, actually, they were shocked when he was able to, uh, you know, provide you know the tracks and the gantries and that because their satellite imagery confirmed everything that he was saying pretty much. Because you know they compared they they were had site, satellites on the site. They they thought it was a. Uh, potential underground nuclear facility. So, and then they saw all this activity and various things that he described in his remote viewing and it was confirmed by, you know, overhead uh, satellites like the corona and other things like that. So, you know, it was almost a perfect match. There are a few things he got wrong, but for the most part, he, he got it pretty much right by remote viewing. Well, and according to Putoff, he he uh, said that it had something to do with um, the space program and uh, the CIA or whoever was running the program at that point said, you know, debunked that and said, thought that that was proof that he was not, you know, it wasn't as accurate. But then Putoff says afterwards they... Um, 
you know, they went there after the Cold War was over and proved that it was. <laughs> Let me just share a, a, yeah. a short audio on that point. The people of Los Alamos were sure that this is a particle beam weapons facility. And they said, well, you know, the crane is pretty impressive, but he says this is for some space project, and we know it's not for that, so you can't really trust this data. When the Cold War was over, we got to go over there. It turned out it was for a space project. Well, this is all fine, but remember, they did not like us getting this kind of data. That's where I wanted to bring that in again, where uh, Pudoff says they didn't like us getting that kind of data. Yeah, they may have been averse to it. it yeah, it's interesting that they hired uh, Pat Price uh, as a contractor. It's mentioned in Cress's article, and they had assigned him for Department B D. Department D was a uh, interagency activity where they broke into various <coughs> counselor and embassies, uh, you know, to uh, to get information on you know various countries, and uh, he was tasked to find where uh, their uh, <coughs> secure rooms were, where their you know their <coughs> intelligence community was in the building so uh, that they could break whose intelligence was he looking for whose intelligence rooms well we're looking for you for instance uh, where the kgb was in the okay. russian embassy and, and where they would hide their files so that they had a, an opportunity to break into those areas and you know copy the files and things like that. And then mm -hmm. uh, they had a task to, for, to find uh, terrorist bases in Libya. And the year after that, uh, well, while he was being tasked to do that, he died mysteriously, you know, for some reason. In, the, yeah. in Las Vegas, where um, a year later, uh, L. Ron Hubbard's son also was found dead. I don't know if there's any connection, but right. it's just coincidental. Um, yeah, it's one of those serendipitous things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His death is uh, is another topic, but um, at the time he died in somewhere in July of uh, 1975. But you know, sometime before that, he had uh, obviously done all these uh, these other things. He was working for the CIA after he had demonstrated this. Um, this gantry and other things he'd done, they hired him. He was also working for uh, some coal exploration companies, which um, just before he died, he had uh, was going to bring his son. He's got a son that he was going to bring into that business with him. But he was working for them to find deposits of where for them to where where they would best, uh, you know, mine and find coal. Uh, I'm sure that he was, if he'd have stayed on track, he would have been working for some gold or silver mining outfits at some point. But um, Pat was, um, I'll just say a few things about him. I mean, he told me some things that um, I've always hesitated to mention because there was other, there's more data. Let me just put it this way. There's more data that he acquired that probably spooked them. He was able to get some detail, like if he got documents and names of programs and so forth from a secure NSA facility. Well, he went beyond that as far as being able to gather information about these facilities. Um, a little example is uh, this was in the height of the Cold War, and nobody knew it at the time, but it's well known now that off the coast of Southern California, of course, there's Catalina Island. But the Soviets had placed uh, passive sonar devices along the ocean floor out there to monitor U.S. shipping, uh, military uh, traffic on the seas, in and out of Long Beach and San Diego there. 
And of course, that's a heavy route between San Francisco, the whole West Coast. So he told me about that at the time. And that was like something that was not in the public domain and not well known. So um, he was very uh, interesting character because he'd come up with stuff like that and he had no no lack of any kind of uh, you know carefulness or uncertainty about his abilities if you ever wanted to like use the example of somebody that was tone 40 it was Pat Price I mean uh, we use that terminology in Scientology meaning just intention without reservation and he had absolutely no hesitation or question about certainty on what he knew and what he didn't know and where he was going, what he was doing. And he's a very friendly guy too. Um, but uh, I, I guess this would be a good point since I'm talking about him, but he also told me where the UFO bases were on, <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> and uh, of course, when people bring up the subject of remote viewing, they go quickly into, uh, you know, UFOs and uh, extraterrestrials. And it kind of gets, goes off into La La Land from that point on. But nevertheless, just as an aside, not to take go down that road too far, um, he not only knew where they were, but why they would fly periodically. And he told me that it was because every seven years they needed to regenerate their, uh, they probably weren't batteries, but their, uh, their engines. And um, the UFOs that would fly out of these locations, they were based in some mountain ranges on the planet, but they would, um, they were renegades from um, another system and they needed, they were sort of on the lam, hiding out here. Now, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt, but that's what he told me. And that's what was his data. I'm going to play one thing here. Um, that Putoff says about Price and the um, UFOs. I do recall when we got some, Pat Price, this is in the open literature now, volunteered that he found some UFO bases on the planet. And one of them was in Australia. And so uh, somebody in the air, I turned the data in, Somebody in the agency called the station chief without telling him why he was asking and said, uh, can you tell me what's going on over there in the Mount uh, whatever, I forget what it was, area. And the guy said, oh, you mean where all the UFOs come and go? <laughs> <laughs> so he was not just me that he was talking about it. <laughs> but um, interesting character um, and it definitely got the attention and possibly who knows if that got him killed being too good at what he was doing I don't know but uh, certainly is knowing our beloved intelligence agencies um, it wouldn't surprise mm. me they were certainly not above what they what do they call it wet work when it came to oh, yeah. eliminating threats. Yeah. Yeah, his, his so, death was definitely mysterious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no autopsy was done so to confirm whether he died of a heart attack or not. <clears throat> and some people seem to think that he was poisoned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. There's uh, about those UFO bases, though. It's interesting because uh, Ron talks about that in a lecture called "The Role of Earth." You know about the fourth and fifth invader forces. So, and he talks about specific areas on Earth where there there might be UFO base or two. So. <clears throat> yeah. Well. UFOs are definitely a fascinating subject and uh, extraterrestrial visitations of planet Earth, but it's not remote viewing what we're dealing with here today. <laughs> so we'll take that up for another podcast, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the, 
it was interesting that Pat Price would stray into that. A lot of remote viewers did. I think it, it was an effort to to uh, discredit the subject with the public to a greater or lesser degree, you know, make it seem too incredible. So that's my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Like, oh, they, they, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, you know, uh, as I was going to say, you know, like, oh, UFOs and remote viewing, you know, they go together. And only wackos, you know, as we know, the CIA had been dis trying to discredit since uh, the Robertson's panel anyone who even mentioned the subject of UFOs or took UFOs seriously. So, you know. The CIA actually was working assiduously on invalidating anyone who ever brought up the subject, while at the same time researching it separately on their own. Yeah, well, that's same with one of the tech. That's that's the technique, you know, is either make it uh, you're crazy, the um, you know, your uh, conspiracy theorists or. Uh, you know, poo-pooing it, and that's where I said earlier on, you know, people are going to have to get real smart about putting the pieces together for themselves as to what possible implications the successes these guys had and the fact that they came out of the technology that L. Ron Hubbard developed to what might have been the thought process of these um, intelligence agencies uh, as regard to putting a lid on it, getting control of it, and shutting it down. So... Um, I've got a couple of quotes where Pat Price is, uh, you know, validated, you could say. There's one by Jimmy Carter uh, after, years later, um, they were trying to find a, uh, a plane that, a, a Soviet plane that had gone down in Africa. And Carter was quoted by Reuters in Reuters as saying that a plane went down in Zaire. Spy, spy satellites failed to locate the wreckage. CIA Director Admiral Stansel Turner turned to a remote viewer and Carter said, she gave some latitude and longitude figures. We focused our satellite cameras on that point and the plane was there. So Carter acknowledging that that was one of the few uh, public statements of a, especially a sitting president that remote viewing was an operational tool the CIA was using. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Because when they, they quote, you know, uh, ostensibly closed down the project in 1996, they, I mean, they lied and said that the project was never used uh, operationally. <laughs> you know, and, you know, various remote viewers have since written books that demonstrate that the you know it was used operationally since it was first uh, initiated in SRI so it's you know it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors you know just blowing smoke and what you know like it's hard to believe that they spent close to over two decades quote solely doing research on the phenomenon you know without util yeah. utilization of it no. Right. Especially you know, when you have ridiculous. that backdrop. When you have that backdrop, they had no qualms about, you know, they come up with a new drug called LSD and giving it to everybody on their staff and everybody in sight. So they had no qualms about putting something operational almost instantaneously as soon as it was like a new toy. So the idea that they'd be getting this kind of results from this project at Stanford Research Institute and wouldn't you know, make it operational is just ridiculous. In fact, we know it's it's an open it's open information that Price went to work for the CIA, and uh, I don't know about Swan, but some of the others, and then of course later on was taken over by the military and so forth. They they definitely tried to, you know, op make it operational. Uh, there's just another example of where in the uh, the famous incident of the hostage Iranian hostage crisis or case. Um, I'm not sure if it was actually Price or which remote viewer, but anyway, they had given up on trying to, 
uh, foretell when they were going to be released. And but a remote viewer had said that one was going to be released. Turned out it was the case, and so that was a famous example of where remote viewing had been used to predict, you know, when some an international event was going to happen, and it was another operational example. I'm just going to throw that one in. Well. <laughs> Well, Pat Price himself was involved in locating the Sibonese Liberation Army who had kidnapped uh, the uh, Patricia Hearst. heiress to Patricia Hearst, basically. Yeah. And uh, he, was, he was involved in helping to track her down and, and the army itself, you know, back in the early 70s. And one thing that isn't known, the CIA were intensively involved in trying to track down the location of the, uh, you know, SLA, uh, even even to the point of, of flying U-2s over suspected areas where they might have had an encampment. Of course, nobody knows about this because the CIA was, according to their charter, weren't supposed to operate uh within the confines of the U.S., you know? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That's what, no, that's what Well, uh, there's um, some other players involved in this. Uh, at the time, I'll just mention one name. Yuri Geller came into fact. In fact, uh, Putoff had a, a funny quote about Yuri Geller. Now, for anybody that doesn't know, he was famous for bending spoons, telekinesis, uh, an Israeli guy. Right. But, um, according to Putoff, <laughs> he what? Worked for the Mossad. Well, I'm sure, yeah. He's um, Israeli intelligence. Yeah. But Putoff said he got 90% of the publicity and did 1% one, 1 of the results. So um, that that could have been another, you know, uh, means of invalidating it, you know, putting it up to ridicule uh, the spoon benders as they became known. Uh, you got the uh, Randy, the what's his name, the guy who's the debunker. Um, so oh, yeah, they yeah. came out of the, they came out of the woodwork to poo poo and uh, invalidate this whole thing, uh, which is very similar to what we've seen over the decades uh, with Scientology as well. But it's just interesting that even a CIA sponsored thing in the public, it's pretty much ridiculed. If you go to Wikipedia or whatever, you know, they're going to say it's much ridiculed. No results were there. Nobody ever proved that it really worked. The CIA quit the program. In other words, lie, 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 all the way down the line, just like we started off this by showing some of the lies. Um, I came up with one quote as we wind this down, but um, remote viewing in the hands of the CIA was like handling a teenager a case of beer and the keys to a Ferrari and saying, have fun. Um, so, <laughs> you know who, uh, who that quote was from? Uh, no, I don't. Does it, ring, it doesn't ring a bell, probably. That's because it's mine. I made it up no. myself. <laughs> I caught you. Oh, cool. That's a good quote. <laughs> yeah. That pretty anyway. much says it right there. As an example, I mean, LSD should be a prime example right there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. As far as remote viewing goes, yeah. yeah. Probably, yeah, you sure. know, they're, they're biochemical personalities for sure. <laughs> yeah. So... I think we've done a pretty good job on giving examples of what this was all about, what was done, the experiments that they that they conducted, the key players that were, even though they didn't admit it, they were Scientologists. Of course, Pat Price would have never had any uh, problem in admitting it. I, probably one of the reasons he couldn't be he couldn't be controlled. 
So that one might be one of the reasons he had to be done away with, besides what he, the data he was coming up with. Um, but, um, and, you and, know, there's that. And uh, he was also reporting to the Guardian's office as well, you know, on, on the project. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. people say there's no proof of that, but <laughs> I can prove it pretty much because uh, he, well, his, his memorial service was at Celebrity Center. It was conducted by Heber Gents, who was at who was at that time worked for the Guardian's office, was in the uh, uh, PR bureau of the GO. But I was, like I say, roommates with him. Or we shared a house, and um, you know he'd come back from a meeting. My uh, girlfriend at the time was pretty high positioned in the guardian's office and they would reference having a meeting earlier in the day, <laughs> you know, at the GO uh, over dinner, they'd be having this type of a conversation. So there's no question in my mind that he uh, was reporting to, or the guardian's office knew very well what he was doing, his experiments. If he told me all these stories, he certainly was relaying them to him or he was relaying them to the, those stories to them as well and oh yeah you know we we, we mentioned connecting some dots you know that um, a year after his death uh, Quentin Hubbard died in Las Vegas and then about well a little more than a year after that the um, Guardian's office was raided and um, by the government and all the documents taken and that brings us up to 1977. So there's this trail yeah, and that's connected. You see, and and our our you know our our fourth estate you know doing its work doesn't mention the fact that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of documents that were never released to the public regarding that raid, which contained reports about remote viewing and such because remote viewing is considered highly classified at that time. So they never released all the, you know, the files that, you know, they released all the ones that would discredit the church, like, you know, Operation Freakout and uh, all that kind of stuff, like, you know, Snow White, you know, documents related to Snow White, but they never released any of the files that the, the GEO had had served typically attained through, uh, you know, people like Pat Price and, and other operatives working in the government, you know. So uh, there is a, there is a, a lot of, a lot of hidden factors in that whole thing, you know. The, I mean, the full story was never told. It was just, you know, the church <laughs> infiltrated the government. You know, never mind the fact that the, the government had, for since the beginning, had been infiltrating Scientology and, you know, trying to undermine the subject practically since day one, you know, but uh, no mention of that, you know, violating the First Amendment of the Constitution. Eh, that's nothing, you know, but, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting how uh, uh, they try, turn the whole tables on that. And, uh, yeah. You know, well, and like I said, from a 45-year uh, perspective, looking back and seeing the trail of things that have occurred, uh, a lot of these things are a little more understandable or more obvious, you know, when we uh, look at them as a as a timeline and a series of events that, at the time, you know, seemed to be random or no connection and missing data on it all. But looking back, we can sort of see that there's some connection to these things. They're not just random events. There was a cause and effect relationship between the intelligence agencies proving that Scientology could develop these capabilities within people and give them access to information that they wouldn't like them to have. So therefore, uh, what do you do about that? And that's, um, I think, part of the history of Scientology and the whole story. But um, I guess we'll wrap this up now. I'm going to plug the next show. We're going to do another one. We're going to take it from here. Yeah, since we, since we, yeah, since we pretty much segued into the next show. 
yeah we almost automatically want to do that but um we'll do it on another show and we'll uh, segue to the development of remote viewing uh within the government and where it went and also some uh more insights into the impact that it had on the church and the whole movement of scientology as well as i thought it'd be fun to do some some processing we've got some things that we could do that would give people a taste of not only remote viewing but exteriorization so mm -hmm. uh i think that would be fun to sort of you know and a little tease to get people to come back <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah. we'll, uh oh, yeah. we'll give you the opportunity to go outside your body how's that uh, not you particularly uh robin but anybody listening so yeah we'll give fun. them a grand tour yeah. <laughs> all right well yeah. let me uh, close this off and let you go and i really appreciate you um joining in again uh robin you've been a big uh, help and uh have some excellent information about all of this so thank you very much for joining me today and i'll look forward to getting together with you again and doing the next show okay dave it was it's been it's been fun We'll uh, talk at you later then. Okay. Thanks again, Robin. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. You're welcome. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, that wraps up another episode of the Scientolopedia podcast. Thanks for joining. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel. Go to our website. Find us on our Facebook group and see you here next time.